Next speaker, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Norbert Müller from Engel, Austria. Um, Dr. Norbert Müller is Vice President Global Applications Engineering for Engel, Austria. And I'm very excited for your presentation. Thank you very much. Bastian, thank you very much. A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my today's presentation on processing of thermoplastics composites, a contribution to circular economy and sustainability. So I come from Engel, and Engel is a manufacturer of injection molding machinery. And we have solutions for the circular economy issue with thermoplastic materials. And some of them I would like to present you today to you. But first, perhaps some words on what is application engineering doing at the machine manufacturer. We have different production sites, three of them in Austria, one in Czech Republic. There are sites in China, in, in the US, and so on. And what we do is uh, making injection molding machinery from small size to really large size dimensions. And what the machines are doing is normally plasticizing thermoplastic material, injection molding components, technical products, also uh, products for everyday use, packaging components. And at the end, those machines also produce quite a bit of a waste. And today we are at a, uh, at a conference where the focus is on composite components and therefore we also have to think about what at the end will we do with the waste that is arising from such uh, components. Application engineering is running the machines at the lab sites we have in our, uh, in our production plants, uh, but also at the customers' sites. Uh, we make trials with materials. And uh, we also can um, support our customers with the expertise which is necessary to show what's possible with such machinery. So we uh, have a processing aspect, we have technologies which, will be, which are covered at, uh, at, at the engineering department. Uh, then we do the evaluation, we look very closely on our machinery. Uh, so this is kind of a testing, but not a testing in the, in the framework of a development of a machine, but more in the framework of uh, what else can we do and what still needs to be improved and to be changed on the systems to have something for the next generation. And of course, at the end, also services. When something is not working as it was expected, then the people from application engineering meet you there and will solve such an issue with you. As I mentioned, small machines, also large machines. This is a 5,500 tons machine, so this is not uh, the, 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 the person which is standing in front. This is regular size. And as you see, in some cases, it's also quite a difficult task to choose the dimension of the machine, but also the components of the machine. What should be inside there? For example, to make a large components for water collection, which is a very important thing, which is uh, done in different countries with uh, systems made injection molding components for uh, collection of water. And what is then the plasticizing unit? And we have a quite close look on plasticizing of thermoplastic materials today. A bunch of technologies in the top line, in the middle you see there is a brake pedal. Uh, we denote this as organomelt. This is a combination of organic sheet and molten material, uh, but also other components like gas-assisted injection molding and so on. Those are components which normally consist of one thermoplastic material plus fibers. Fibers, in the most cases, uh, glass fibers. And these materials can be used and reused uh, several times, and this is what we intend to do with the technologies uh, to be established for circular economy of thermoplastics. And there are forces driving us forward, especially regulations that come from the government. So for 2019, we had a uh, European regulation, 70% of the material needs to be recycled for 2025, the expectation is already 55%. In between, we had the ban of microplastics. And in 2030, we should achieve 65% of recycling rate with thermoplastic materials and also a ban of single-use uh, plastic components, which is uh, normally addressed to the packaging uh, area. So where is a machine manufacturer situated like that? In the green circle, you see there is a 
machinery, which is delivered by a machine manufacturer. But before the machine is chosen, there is already a person who is deciding about what should the part look like. So affecting also these uh, early stages of decisions on what will be done, which material will be used, is it a material which is recyclable or not, and so on, is a, a high concern, which at the end uh, affects uh, if we can close the loop, and we can close it once or two or three times, or if we have serious trouble with that. And, uh, of course, we then have the collection, we need to sort the materials, and um, we also are in, still in a cooperation with the material manufacturer, who is either doing chemical or mechanical recycling, but the attempt is always to keep the close, uh, the loop as, as small as, as it is possible. So the best idea would be to have a large component, structural component in the field, which is used for an automotive application, for example, and the manufacturer of that component still knows in which car it is running, knows about the mileage uh, the, uh, the, the part has seen, and brings it back to his own loop, let's say after two, three, five years, and after 100,000 kilometers, uh, the part was in use, and uh, still knowing what the material is inside, and then we can have a regrind and a reuse route, which gives us at the end the same component at a technically high quality without having too much of uh, materials and uh, fractions in the, in the material which we do not want. So, as mentioned, we need to discuss about technologies for recycling. So this is, for example, to avoid additional material, especially too much metal components. Some metal components can be uh, talk, taken out of the component, but to avoid the metal components is one thing to go. And then at the machinery side, we have a situation that we need to expect a bit more variations and uh, let's say higher and lower viscosity, a different behavior during the injection of the material. And therefore, we need to have uh, assistance systems which are capable to level this out. And this uh, is mentioned under IQ weight control. And I will explain this in detail a bit uh, later on. But other things are also of concern, for example, when we do not exactly know which material will be on the machine, we need to be ready for, let's say, kind of additional wear on the metal components of the injection molding machine on the plasticizing unit, and therefore it needs to be very rigid and withstands this additional stress. Yeah? And machine concepts like degassing or even filtering on an injection molding machine is something which is already possible and existent. Then we come to the point, um, is it still necessary to do all that effort with a lightweight design in, uh, in, in mobile applications? And the discussion was a bit... Um, there is recuperation. So when a car is heavier, we get more energy back from recuperation. This is... In, to a certain extent true, but it all still depends on the weight the component has in the early beginning. So a lighter car normally uses less fuel and also uses less electricity to, let's say, reach a distance of 100 kilometers. And this is true no matter if it is combustion-driven or electrically driven, and that's the reason why we still see uh, a demand and an existing and even growing demand for lightweight components. This is one of the few components I can present to you, um, which is a front-end structure, which is utilized in a Mercedes-Benz car, and was replacing a metal component which was necessary to be combined with some um, plastic components. The structural uh, aspect was in the metal, but there are also air ducts which deliver, in this case, still a combustion engine with the air intake. And this was combined in one component and gives us and yields us a weight saving of 1.3 kilograms. So those components go out in the field and First, we think about when it comes back, let's say after 10 years, can we grab it, can we regrind it? This is an issue. But another very important issue is what already happens during the production of such components. And this is, we have quite a bit of a cut-off from uh, the material which is produced. On the left-hand side, you see a picture of a production of a thermoplastic uh, composite material. This is a site of uh, the company Profol. And um, this is a tape-based polypropylene 
plus glass grade gives you at the end a kind of organo sheet, non-woven, with 73% weight percent of glass fibers inside. And then producing a component as shown beforehand will lead to 5, 10, perhaps 30% of a cut of material, which is a very worthy uh, and neat and post-industrial waste, which needs to be utilized as, if possible, to 100%. And this is uh, a large component, one meter in length, 10, 10 centimeters of width. This is something which doesn't go on an injection molding machine. And therefore, we made trials in cooperation with a company, Pure Loop, which is an ERIMA division, uh, 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 manufacturer for recycling machinery, and such a machine is capable to regrind such material in one step to a granule, which is again injection moldable. 73% weight percent of glass fiber content in an injection molding grade is a quite bit too much, and therefore we need to add virgin material or might even add recycling material with no fibers inside, so can be another stream where we get some polypropylene, which is uh, to be added at the end to um, the, the, the resin to end up with something we want, polypropylene in the range of 40%, and you see we uh, in that uh, trial we ended up with a 35% of a uh, fiber content is something which can be moldable. Yeah? You see, we have a typical granule. Um, we find fiber length in the material of up to five millimeters, and this is uh, completely sufficient for doing the injection molding step of such thermoplastic composite components. On the right-hand side, you see pictures where we have a tape stacking, a base layer, then we combine this, consolidate this to a platen, then there is a shaping and an overmolding, and the overmolding is a step where we need a granule, which can come from such a recycling circular route. So at the end, we have 100% of material utilization. Uh, in this case, a tape-based component, we cut this, uh, pieces we need for the production of the composite component. Um, this is difficult to handle directly in the injection molding machine, so we have a regrind, we end up with a granulate, and this processing route is something which gives us an opportunity for the post-industrial waste, but of course is also suitable for the post-consumer waste when such a large component comes back from utilization, from service, to be uh, recycled like that again. And now I have another example where we at the end have a smaller loop. So this is the result of those tests where we were comparing a virgin material with glass fibers inside and then we compared this to the uh, regranulate uh, achieved by this processing route with the glass fibers inside and plasticizability was uh, fairly the same, but we had some little alterations, some up and down in the viscosity, and this is uh, which was answered by an assistance system approach. So when it is a standard injection molding process, not, not too much needs to be modified. If it is a new virgin material or a high quality regranulate or even some, let's say, shreddering material. Um, and there is an error which mentions uh, IQ weight control and this is to be explained uh, quickly. What do we do? We measure the injection pressure over position of the screw. The screw is pushing the melt in the mold and this reading is kind of a reference curve. And then we have a, a very crucial parameters. This is a switch over position from injection to packing. And uh, we have a level of this switch over pressure. So we read this diagram from, the ref, uh, from right to the left. And uh, the green one is the reference. The black one is the, the actual curve. And um, this is a bit animated. The machine now realizes, okay, there is more pressure necessary uh, to inject the material, and therefore I need to modify the injection conditions a bit. So then there is an algorithm behind this reading is subdivided in a, a shutting pos injection volume position, it is subdivided in a viscosity contribution, and it is, uh, there are also some artifactual uh, things which are uh, also denoted. And then we can adjust switch over position and with a 
blue dots and the green dots, you can see how much the, uh, the, the, the homogeneity or the accuracy of that compo component's weight is readjusted directly within the running cycle. So this is nothing which is adjusting over several cycles. It's running in the actual cycle and can react on material variations, but also on humidity and also on some uh, behavior variations the machine itself ha has, for example, with uh, components which are in, in the plasticizing uh, unit uh, contained. But what to do? When we see this is not enough, so IQ weight control can uh, react on some uh, viscosity variations, but now we have a regrind where still there is some, some uh, variation in the water content, so we should have a degassing. And then there are completely things like sand and uh, dirt, which was not expected. We need to have a filtering. And um, then we end up with a situation where we completely need to change the, the plasticizing system. In this case, the clamping unit stays the same, but we have kind of an assembly kit. We do the injection either by a screw or by a piston, and then we can combine this with a degassing unit or with a filtering unit and with a pre-plasticizing, and we even can add a virgin fibers uh, when the fiber content is not high enough. So we have, let's say, some material from the market which 23% of uh, fiber content and we want to end up with something which is again 35. Then we can add the fibers during this after filtering of the material in the process. And this is a comparison with this two-stage process in combination to a single-stage process. So standard injection molding is single-stage process. Two-stage means a kind of a pre-plastication and uh, this these two um, lines uh, denote the minimum and the maximum fly fiber length, and you see we found four to six millimeters of fiber length with a two-stage process, and this was even more than it was the case in the typical single-stage pr process where uh, a virgin material was in utilization. And this is what we intend to do to have specialized machinery we have such components. This is a door structural component. At the end is made from virgin composite, uh, continuous fiber material, but the injection molding component is added from a circular economy approach. So to summarize, there are options where we can either work with large components that come from post-industrial waste, or uh, we have also options with machinery that gives us kind of an assembly kit uh, where um, we either have a pre-plastication plus a a piston or a second screw and have then an opportunity to produce 100% uh, recycling use of the material which was in the first run in a composite component and each circle we achieve is a contribution to less um, carbon footprint and a contribution to more sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Müller, for this very interesting presentation. I think it's, I think it's great how even machine builders uh, f find new and, and smart technologies to adapt uh, the processes and to allow for better circularity of materials. I found it really impressive, your IQ uh, technology that you presented. Are there any questions from the audience? We still have time for one, maybe two questions. Please use the microphones on either side. I don't see a question for now. I do have a question. So you mentioned it's possible to, in, uh, during the process, to adapt uh, uh, the par machine parameters to allow for this constant good quality. And co I think you showed the weight of a component yep. to have uh, the constant good fill grade of, of, the, of the part. What, what, what kind of variations are, the, are you able to, to compensate with this, with this mm. technology? I mean, how pure or how unpure can your... Mm. Uh, can your so we, recycle we already part? made trials where the machine was running, let's say, uh, for 10 shots with a virgin new material, and then we switched over to a completely regrind grade, which was not the same material, which was a similar material, and uh, this can be an alteration of the viscosity of, let's say, plus minus 10%, mm. and uh, this uh, is still in the range which is possible to be uh, adjusted and modified 
by, by the parameters, the machine is able to react by itself. Uh, but it's important to mention su such a change is, is, is uh, coming a bit, a bit gradually. So the machine has for several shots and several parts to be made little time to adjust. But also when the material stays the same, but uh, let's say first and second shot was very good, but the third shot was for some weird reason nobody knows, uh, quite easy to inject. And then the machine is still capable to react in that short time to let's say change the switch over position and again to have a completely filled component. Okay, yeah. cool, thank you. Maybe time for one more question. Is there one more question from the audience? Yeah, there. Use the microphone. Yes. Uh, I also think it was super interesting, this IQ system. I just wanted to know, uh, what kind of sensors do you use to, how does the machine know that the part is, that is being done right now could be not perfect? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, is it, the machine has to have some kind of sensors to... Yeah, uh, there is, for this assistance system, there is no sensor in the mold. Uh, this is another option we have, but in this case, there is no sensor in the mold. And the measurement of the pressure during the injection is a regular reading we always have. During the injection, we normally are in a, in a velocity-dominated phase, so we give the machine, uh, please uh, run forwards uh, the screw with a 200 millimeters per second, and we have a reading for the pressure. And this reading is even not obtained directly in the melt. It's a reading that comes from the hydraulic system or from the electrical drives when it is an electrical machine. And uh, there needs to be calculations done. We have some friction in the system and so on. So it's quite a bit of a calibration work. But this is sensitive enough to have the data already aboard of the machine to end up with such uh, assistance systems. Yeah.